Good morning, everyone. Please take your seat. We're about to start. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Internet Governance Forum 2022 Youth Summit. My name is Anred Esterhuisen. I'm from South Africa. I am very happy to have an IJF in Africa. <laughs> and, um, and I'm the outgoing MAG chair, um, and I, I work in civil society and have been involved in the IJF for a long time. So I've had the honor and the pleasure of seeing the youth caucus and the youth community in the IGF just grow from strength to strength. And I also have to, and I don't think it's inappropriate for me to say that the African youth have been a particularly strong force in the global IGF youth. So um, today, um, we are going to start our session. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of, of uh, background on it. Um, today's session is the culmination of work that the IGF youth um, have been doing over the last few months. So, so, so this is not brand new. And the session today is, is addressing three main issues which youth have identified as important, not just for youth in IJF, but for the IJF um, as a whole to consider. Firstly, the opportunities for social prosperity and digital transformation, um, and, and, and that the internet and, and internet governance holds, and how particularly the domains of education, economy, and peace can be advanced through digital means. Secondly, um, we also have to look at challenges. What are the challenges that are preventing people from fully benefiting from digital transformation opportunities? And how can we mitigate online harms, prevent cyber attacks, and protect human rights online? And then the third issue, working towards a better digital future. How can we do that? How can we achieve a better tomorrow? And what action-oriented insights can we develop and share to ensure a safer, more secure, and sustainable digital environment through synergies between the current and next generations of experts and leaders and, and practitioners. Um, so I want to welcome all our online participants as well. Um, I can't see you, but I know you are there. And, and in fact, I think our online participants really represent the power of digital. So I think they deserve a special welcome. Um, our session is going to be opened with a recorded um, remarks um, from the Under Secretary General of the UNDESA, that's the Division for Economic and Social Affairs, um, Mr. Lee Junhua. And Mr. Lee, um, um, is, is, he assumed the position of Under Secretary General um, in, in DESA earlier this year. So I think this is his first IJF as well. He's not in the room with us at the moment, but you might get the opportunity to hear him because he has um, chosen, fortunately, to be here with us in person. So um, can we put the, the recorded remarks from Mr. Lee um, online now, please? Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, my dear young friends, I'm pleased to address you that on behalf of the United Nations. And this year's IGF, one of the strongest partnerships has been with young people coming from around the world. Thank you for your hard work. 
the 17th annual meeting of the IGF is being hosted on the youngest continent of all. Over 60% of the people living in Africa region are below the 30 years of the age. People under 30 are around half of the old people living on our planet. Your voice must therefore be heard. This is even more true for discussions on our digital reality. Your generation makes up the largest group of internet users. Digital is your lifestyle. Mobile and computer devices are your access to information, education, social, economic, political, and cultural life. Advanced digital technologies such as artificial intelligence, the internet of things, blockchain, robotics, quantum computing, and others are becoming more and more relevant to you. Dear participants, dear friends, digital transformation has been changing many areas of our lives so quickly that we are left behind in regulations. We need to ensure that this and the similar technologies are safe to use. At the same time, we must ensure young people have access to them and importantly, know how to use them. This call for an investment in human capacity, digital infrastructure, reliable devices, and digital literacy. It is an investment directly shaping your present and your future. The IGF is a unique platform to address this challenge. At the IGF, you can meet different stakeholders from different regions and ensure your voice are heard by those who can make a change now. It is also a platform for you to connect to others and learn through the exchange of the good practices. Peace use today wisely and actively. As the internet generation, you are its ambassadors. As you advocate for change and progress, please don't forget those deprived of accessing or using digital technologies. Whether among your peers, older persons, women and girls, persons with disabilities, or people living in remote and rural areas. Remember that your voice stands also for those who cannot be here. They speak through you. I look forward to your deliberations. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Lee, for, for, for uh, being here in spirit, in person, and um, virtually. And we're now going to commence with our, with our program. And I just want to tell you a little bit about how it's going to work. We're going to have to keep tight time. We started a bit late because the previous session ended a bit late. And we're going to go through the three themes that I highlighted. For each theme, we'll have two speakers who will give very short inputs. And then I'll hand over to, to members of the youth community who will then moderate um, short interventions from the floor, from participants remotely, that have to be restricted to one minute each, max. So I'm still going to keep time, even if they are moderating. And, and our first topic that we're now delving into is opportunities for social prosperity um, provided by digital transformation. We have two speakers here, and I believe one is in the room already, Barak. Barak is here, so I'm very happy to pass on to a colleague that I respect hugely, that I've worked with for many years, Mr. Barak Otiena from Kenya, and he's chairman of the board of trustees of DOT Africa, the DOT Africa Foundation. Barak, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Henriette, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, especially for those that are following us online. Um, my name is Barak Otieno, as I have been ably introduced. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to speak to this gathering of the youth, although I'm no longer youthful. 
as per the constitution of uh, my country, Kenya, where I come from. Uh, but the youth continue to play an important role um, in uh, development of the internet and the policy processes globally. Uh, I'll just make, in the interest of time and the time that I've been given, uh, a few key points uh, that first and foremost, just to commend the youth for pushing and ensuring that uh, uh, they are on the table and not on the menu, as has been on the, in the past. I know it's been a challenge to even have uh, a caucus such as this in the IGF forum. Previously, the youth were just part and parcel of panels. But I think now the voice of the youth is being heard in a very big way. Uh, I think at Africa Internet Governance Forum, MAG, there's a position for the youth, and so is the other um, national and regional initiatives in other parts of the world. So congratulations to the youth. Uh, I hear a common saying in Kenya where I come from that power is taken. It is not given. Uh, but I think even when power is taken, it requires a lot of responsibility. So as youth, it is not just enough to desire to be on the table. Uh, we have to have the pedigree that ensures that when we are on the table, we are able to sustain the seat on the table. Otherwise, we'll be asked to move at the back. And uh, as I say this, I also want to point out that uh, just looking at the internet, some of the statistics, there are about 1.2 billion youth globally. The internet value chain is largely driven by young people or the youth. If we look at uh, the big tech, uh, whether Facebook, uh, Amazon, Google, something common is that most of the founders are the youth. So I don't see any reason why the youth should not be at the table uh, of driving important policy decisions when it comes to uh, how the internet is mainstreamed in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that is the challenge that I want to pose in this particular room, that probably we need to move from the back room, we need to move from the developer rooms to the front uh, table. We've seen cases in which uh, big tech have been summoned by Congress in the US and in many other countries because of digitization, because uh, the things that we are developing in the back room have a great impact on societies. We can see that uh, if we take cumulatively how some, the amount of money that the big techs are making, uh, they're equivalent to GDPs of some of the countries uh, in the continents that we come from. So we can no longer underestimate uh, the, what we, the, the shift that we are causing in the world. And I think this is the challenge uh, that I really want to pose to us who, is, who are in the room that even as we develop the apps, even as we develop the solutions uh, that are driving marketplaces and that are driving economies, it's also imperative and important that we start understanding um, policy and political frameworks that determine the acceptability of uh, the different solutions that we are developing. Uh, another important thing is that it is one thing to develop, it is another thing to maintain. Uh, speaking from the African region that I'm familiar with, uh, one of the areas we have made attempts, and I think this is not unique to Africa, it is also common globally, is to build communities of practice. If you look at uh, the different parts of the world, how the internet is managed, uh, either through the regional internet registry frameworks, you'll find that there are organizations, for instance, in Africa, we have the Africa Network Information Center, uh, that uh, takes care of the numbering in Africa. Uh, there are counterparts uh, in Europe, RIPE, NCC, um, and uh, EPINIC, uh, to name but a few, LACNIC, to name but a few. Uh, I think we need to learn something from uh, the creation of these institutions because that is what has kept the internet going uh, to where it is at the moment. And I think um, if we hadn't created those institutional frameworks, uh, the RALOs in the different regions, uh, it would even be hard for us to have the kind of communities and the kind of caucuses that we have at the moment. So the other thing um, that I'm stressing or emphasizing on is that uh, institutionalization is key because that is what enables our initiatives to stand the test of time. If we look at the journey of the Internet Go Governance Forum, if it hadn't been institutionalized, we wouldn't be sitting at this table today and discussing the things that we are discussing. And there are many who conceptualize the ideas. Some of them were youth, 
uh, just like majority of uh, the people who are in this room, but now they are no longer categorized as youth. But you are the ones who are on the table. And I think the challenge for you is to pick up on uh, the institutional frameworks that were built and check whether they are relevant for the times that we are in. We are talking about artificial intelligence. We are talking about blockchain. Some of the institutional frameworks can no longer stand the test of time as they did 20 years ago or as they did 30 years ago. So what kind of new frameworks do we need at this particular time? I think the answer really lies with the youth. And as we do this... Barak, time, please. Sorry to do this. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm concluding, Madam Chair. Uh, as we do this, um, there are certain things that are common with uh, some of the founders of big tech, and this will be my parting shot. Uh, I think uh, definitely hard work, and most of you are here because of the hard work that you've been doing, uh, will obviously be key uh, in us uh, taking this power or taking the seat at the table. And then being men of our words. The internet is about trust. If people can't trust the product or solution that you are deploying on the internet, uh, then uh, likely uh, your solution will not uh, stand the test of time. Then we need to be good uh, resource managers. As I have mentioned, uh, maintaining institutions, maintaining businesses uh, requires more than youthful passion. It requires skill sets that have to be earned. You need to identify the right mentors, or we need to identify the right mentors who will drive us to the place that we can be. And of course, we need to learn from the mistakes that have done in the past. I conclude at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks very much, Barak. Um, and I, I'll just add that I think the institutionalization that, that Barak mentioned, we need not just in the technical sphere or in the internet marketplace, we need it for digital literacy, we need it for political participation, for democratization, for content creation, for journalism, for women's rights. Um, so I think we do need to work and institutionalize our work. Just working as a collective of individuals is very powerful, but we need to integrate institutions and government, of course, is one of those institutions, I think, that we also need to, to work with and infiltrate. Um, we're now going to go into the open discussion. I want to just alert everyone that the youth have created a page, um, an online page. So if you log into the Zoom session for this um, um, session, you'll find it in the chat. There's a link, a Google Doc, where you can share your ideas, where you can give input, whether you are here in the room or whether you are participating. So the discussion is happening here, but it's also happening on that document. So I'm now handing over to the open discussion on this topic um, to um, Ms. Emilia Zalewska, who's the Polish IGF Youth Coordinator and the ISOC, ISOC Internet Society Foundation um, Youth Program Lead, my country person, um, Marisha Abdol um, Chilunda. So Marisha is with us online. Emilia is here with us in the room. Over to you. Okay. Um, I will allow Emilia to go first, and then I will follow up. Uh, Emilia, the floor is yours. Marisha, just to tell you, your mic might, if you can switch your mic a little bit. So we, we heard you, but we could hear you better. So just for, for your next um, input, go up a little bit in your mic. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the floor. Uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, no, it's still not working well, so just switching mics. Thank you. Is it better? Is it better? Yeah, this is better. Okay, thank you very much for the floor. Uh, and uh, it was really a great uh, pleasure to listen to Barak, Mr. Barak, who told so many kind things about yeah, youth participation and it is also great to see that there's so much things done for youth participation in Africa. I think it can be a real example for all our countries that we can follow. Uh, one thing that really uh, caught my attention is what Mr. Barak said about youth position at the table that is not only had to be uh, maintained but also sustained 
And I think it is something very important we have to uh, remember about that even if you get the attention, draw the attention of other stakeholder groups, it is not uh, gave, uh, given forever. So, uh, and also this attention is, uh, it is not only, it is not enough that we as young people get this attention as, you know, some kind of interesting thing of being young people talking to other young people, but we also need to be actually listened to. Like in policy making processes, law making processes, we actually need to be considered as serious stakeholder groups because we might be differently affected by different regulations in the other way than uh, the other age groups. So also our opinion should not only be treated as something, you know, in the kind of interesting thing we can listen to and then forget about, but we also need uh, to be active part of shaping the process of digital transformation also in the regulatory scope of matters. So thank you very much, and now I'm giving floor to Marisha. Excluded all those in remote areas. Uh, Marisha, we can't hear you. Um, just check that you're unmuted. Uh, I am unmuted. Are you able to hear me now? now we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you to Mr. Barak for his contributions this morning. And thank you so much, Emilia, for opening up our open discussion right now. A direct question to you, Mr. Barak. Um, often we speak about including youth at the table, and that is fantastic. Uh, what we tend to not zone in on intentionally, or perhaps um, unintentionally, is the youth that are still at ground level, the youth that are still in rural communities or in remote communities of their country. What is your view on the digital inclusion um, of youth in remote areas, and how do you think um, we can reach them. Over to you. Um, Barak, did you get that? There was a question for you. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, Mauritia, uh, for that question. Um, I think with the internet, um, the issue of uh, inclusion of the youth in marginalized areas um, is no, should no longer be a challenge. Let me put it that way. Uh, currently, we have options for last mile access uh, that will ensure that uh, unserved and underserved areas are actually connected. And uh, I'm sure most in the room here are already familiar about um, the community network movement that is largely championed uh, by the Internet Society, I believe, for which Mauritia uh, you represent. And uh, now we have models that can be able to uh, guarantee inclusion of um, the youth in unserved and underserved areas. And when I say guarantee, there's still some work that needs to be done at a policy level and um, also at um, technical level. At policy level, we need to really consider uh, the mechanisms that exist uh, that have been um, uh, used as a basis for allocating and managing spectrum in our respective countries. Uh, if you check keenly some of these mechanisms, they focus on areas that are profitable as opposed to uh, areas that um, uh, probably uh, may not uh, bring a return on investment to these commercial investors. Uh, but looking at the history of the Internet, it's important for us to note that the Internet was largely funded or developed uh, using public interest resources. Uh, if we look at the U.S., a lot of uh, uh, 
public money was used either from the National Science Foundation or the military uh, to build uh, what was the initial design of the internet and I don't see why the focus should then shift to commercial uh, interests which then cut, cut out large masses of the population that are considered unserved and underserved. So I think the challenge to the room is that we need to interrogate the policy frameworks within our respective countries and see whether they look at spectrum and uh, internet resources from a purely commercial standpoint or as social goods which can be used to make sure that everyone is included. And secondly, because I believe there are many technicians in this room we need to move from the comfort of the cities, we need to move from the comfort of our keyboards and really go to our rural areas and build infrastructure. Looking around this room, I can see very learned people and even on the online list who can actually go out there and make sure that infrastructure is built. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the history of internet and you look at initiatives such as INET by the Internet Society, there are people who traveled all the way from the comfort of their homes to different parts of the world to ensure that internet infrastructure was actually built and uh, deployed. And as I speak, uh, I'm a community network champion uh, running a community network known as a Herinet in uh, the western part of Kenya and uh, just ensuring that we are leaving no one behind and that the internet is for everyone. So it's not a question of talking. We need to get out there and connect those who are unconnected. We need to get out there and train those who are untrained or those who are digitally illiterate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Barak. And I think that's the perfect way to close this this section on looking at opportunities. Um, we have to create our own opportunities. We have to connect ourselves. Um, we have to collaborate. I think it is about policy and doing advocacy for, for policy that will enable these opportunities that digital transformation hold to be realized. But if we don't take action individually, um, nothing will change. Um, so thanks for that, Barak. We're now moving on to, to the next um, section of today's um, um, summit, which is to look at the challenges. You know, we, I think we are aware of the opportunities. We also are aware of the challenges. We live the challenges. So to talk about the challenges, we have two speakers. Um, we have Vlada Radunovic from the Diplo Foundation, who's with us virtually, and Next to me, um, the IGF Youth's very own um, Edinam Lili Botswoye. So, um, Vlada, are you ready to make your intervention through Zoom? Yes, uh, with, a, with a greeting, uh, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you, Vlada. We can't see you yet. I'm sure you will come on screen, but we can hear you clearly, so please go ahead join you. At least I have, uh, for those that can see me, I have some African elements behind me, so that's at least some link with Africa. And I'm glad that you started with the opportunities. Whenever we go into um, uh, challenges, we tend to frighten people, as if uh, we're really only talking about risks. But sometimes we can actually get the attention, particularly of policy makers, um, if you um, frighten them a little bit. Uh, you will allow me to, to share, and I hope you'll see it, um, just illustrations, and I hope you'll, you'll be able to see it. I want to link to what Barak was talking about, uh, which is the opportunities. One of the failures of our time was actually flying cars. We have been um, thinking about flying cars for over 100 years, and if you see that illustration, this was actually done in 1899, where people were asked, uh, particularly young people, to imagine how the year 2000 would look like. And they imagined the flying cars. And we failed there grandly because we haven't seen fly, flying cars yet. Now this is moving. And if you take a look at what's coming, France is announcing, uh, uh, announcing probably next year, oh, 2024, to have some flying cars at the Olympics over there. Uh, technology is there. But there is a regulatory framework which is probably failing heavily, not necessarily regulatory, policy framework. Let me be uh, very clear there. Uh, the difference is uh, it's not about flying anymore when it comes to car. It's about everything but flying. Flying is just an engine. But you have the, the semiconductors and chips which are actually driving the whole uh, infrastructure of that vehicle and, and the connectivity. You have the satellite links, the cloud. You have the GPS location. You have the wireless or 5G 
communication. We have a lot of sensors on that uh, flying car in future. There is artificial intelligence, which is going to help uh, probably self-drive it and so on. There's so many elements which are digital. And that is something that's, you know, a big deal. Flying car, which I hope many of you will see very soon. And it takes a huge risk of a life if that goes down. But the problem is if you move on to, um, if you scale up or just even come to today's world, you have so many things which are connected today. Uh, and that means electrical grid. That means, of course, Zoom and co communications. Education, which is centralized now connected to cloud. Health sector, um, whatever you imagine is actually connected. Probably soon we'll also have our minds to some extent connected to the net. And everything that's connectable is hackable. And basically there is no more cyberspace. We really have living in a blended space of, of uh, uh, online and, and, and real world. Now, where I'm coming to, I want to, um, there's uh, one interesting, one useful um, equation, if you wish, that the people in cybersecurity and information security like to, uh, to, to uh, emphasize. And that is that we calculate the risk as a combination of assets, of the value of the asset, threats that we have, and vulnerabilities. And if you can imagine it, if you, if you are also visual type, you can imagine it as a small branch of the river where you have some ducklings which are walking over the river on that branch which has a crack in it and down there you have crocodiles in the river so the threat or the risk is if you have crocodiles if you have these ducklings which are an asset that you want to protect and if that branch has a crack which is vulnerable now if you look at the cyberspace today all of those elements are huge the ducklings the assets that we want to protect used to be the computers, then we said, okay, we have data. And then we said, uh, at a certain point, yeah, we have some privacy issues and so on. Now we see we, we also have hospitals. Uh, we had a, a person who died some years ago in Germany because the hospital was under uh, cyber attack. But more and more now we have also the um, democracy, the values, the systems that we basically have to protect. So the assets, the value of the assets is growing immensely. If you look at vulnerabilities, Almost every device, every software, every hardware has some vulnerability. It's intrinsic to technology, but it's also intrinsic to humans. 90% of cyber attacks actually come as a result of, of human hack or of our mistake, right? human social engineering. And then if you look at threats, this crocodile, it used to be uh, probably petty criminals back in the, in the days. Now you have organized criminal groups, which are highly resourced, they can hack everywhere around the world, anyone, and you have governments. And we mapped in the flow about 50 governments that officially say that they have certain uh, capabilities to conduct cyber attacks, military grade cyber attacks, highly sophisticated. And when you have these actors with immense resources, it's much harder to defend. Now, if you look again at that picture with ducklings crossing the the, the, the cracked branch over the river with crocodiles. Imagine who's behind all this, how can we solve these problems? On vulnerability level, is about technology companies, which have to ensure that products are less uh, vulnerable, more secure. It is about uh, regulators, policymakers that have to incentivize uh, both the producers, the vendors, and ourselves as users to ask for more secure products. Then if you look at the assets, it is about um, things that are uh, societal. It's about, as I said, the privacy, elections, values, human rights. It's about policy in, in a broad sense that Barak mentioned. And if you look at threats, we need mechanisms to combat those threats, whether it's criminal groups, whether in that sense some um, um, cybercrime laws and the ways to enforce that. And we also need um, the international peace and security framework, which is developing now in the United Nations. In all of those, you can see different players. It is the government, the regulators, it is the private sector, it is us as the users and technical community setting standards. I'll stop there just to showcase the complexity and why we need you and all of us together. And I'm, I'm really glad to see you uh, sitting over there. So I'm back to you and open for any questions and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vlada. Um, and now um, I'm handing over to Lily. 
Hi, everyone. I could listen to Mr. Vlada um, for as long as possible um, because the issues hit close to home. And now I'll give you a shocker. Each of us are susceptible to attacks online. Like you said, usually we do not mention the challenges to scare people, but we mention challenges so that we can have people well positioned to be able to maximize the use of the, um, the internet space and data spaces because we'll be equipping them with um, skills that will be help them to question the why, the what, and the how. So essentially, everybody is susceptible, like you said, and we are looking at that broad range. We cannot essentially rule out the rigs that exist online, but there are threats and vulnerabilities, one that hackers or people that are on the other end try to evade. So how do we make sure that there is that um, responsibility taken and somebody has a role to play and somebody is accountable for something? He's mentioned a couple of them. So I'm bringing you on the journey from what we have now um, by way of data trust and how we are seeking to ensure that there is um, safety for people that are using the internet. So one thing I want you to remember out of this session is that even though we are all susceptible to attacks, attacks online, and it, does not det it shouldn't deter you from being in the online space, the reason is because there is there's responsibility for us to play for government, for manufacturers, and for international bodies, like you said. Now, we have the issue of cybersecurity from the past, which essentially looks at how we are safeguarding the cyberspace, um, the devices that are uh, produce and all of that. And now we are looking at the human rights part, which deals to a large extent on privacy and how we can protect people's rights um, on the online space. So think about what um, the devices that are protected and also you who are the user and how you are also going to be protected. So this, um, putting the side by side what you have for the hardware and the devices and the cyberspace, and for you as humans, we want to ask what can you do or what can governments do? Now essentially we'll be hearing about legislation and policy. Think about it. Without policy, all the ails offline are only augmented in a giant network like the internet. So if there's no policy, we are, re we are reinforcing the biases, the injustices that are offline. So are looking for things that are guiding the use of technology so that it serves us um, in, the, in, the, in a good way as humans. And, and the other part that we look at when it comes to legisl legislation is what government and um, blocks across the world are working on when it comes to just um, conventions for personal, um, protecting personal data and for cybersecurity in a sense. So your role, because we've mentioned human hacking and social engineering, is that do we have enough education um, for us to also be data literate so much that we can protect our own use of the internet. So there is uh, a blend of responsibilities and we're opening up the conversation based on what will be coming up to see who has a role to play and where we can start from based on what we know um, by way of the protection that exists currently and how we can build on that. Thanks very much, um, um, Lily. And I, I, you know, I just, I'll just say about policy. I think there are just two buts. I think, firstly, how is that policy made? Was it made in a way that was inclusive, that involved the views of, of those that have to comply with that policy? I think that's very important to remember. And was it made in a whole of society way? You know, was was security and securing the assets that Vlada. Uh, described so well. Is that policy just about regime security or government security, or is it about security of, of the internet and people's information and communications? And then the second but, but is, do our institutions, our governments, our regulators, our companies, particularly the, the ones that are in, in the Global South, have the capacity to implement that policy. Mm. So many developing country governments are burdened by complex policy frameworks that they then struggle to implement effectively because they lack the capacity. So just a bit of a reality check there from me. But for, to give us some more input on this topic, we, we're going to the, to the youth now. So we have Tokumiya. Uh, Toko, I don't see you. Are you here in the room? And I know, Roman, you are here with us. So, Roman, why don't you go ahead? And then we have a little bit of time. So we're going to open the floor. If anyone else wants to make an intervention, you can start by, I think, raising your hand. Or if you're online, raising your hand online. Um, and we'll have very short one-minute inputs. But let's first hand over to Roman, who is uh, Roman Tukov, who is the youth IGF from Russia coordinator. Hello, everyone. It's a huge pleasure and honor to start uh, this experience in Ethiopia uh, with this 
a youth component and thanks to the organizers, the secretariat and to all of us who worked uh, to make it happen. Uh, very interesting interventions, very new fresh ideas and very good to see that young people here are sitting on the table and not on the menu, you know, when, when we are uh, not participating in decision making. Of course, I wish that um, our participation was even more meaningful and that uh, it could result with some um, forthcoming plans, roadmaps, action plans, and I believe that we are capable of doing this. Uh, also, what we are capable of? Well, we are capable to ensure that in our countries, young people receive access to technologies. We are lobbying for this, uh, even in Russia, you know, with the highest possible internet penetration in our region, we still have uh, schools or remote areas where we need to work in that direction and I really call upon everyone that this is the priority number one, to ensure that everyone uh, from the youth is connected. Second, I believe that um, in order to uh, prevent the pandemic of happening online, uh, we all should be very careful and we should educate the new generations how to uh, use the internet uh, safely and um, all of us also can work together to ensure uh, youth position and youth vision to be included uh, specifically and uh, how say comprehensively to the global digital compact because as I see this is maybe the first opportunity for us to act together as one uh, as one uh, youth voice and to show our ideas, show that we want to have new frameworks as it was outlined uh, by the first speaker, uh, new, uh, let's say, rules of the game with a clear role of young people. So I believe that the most interesting process is ongoing and just starting now. So I wish all of us good luck and lots of energy and passion to drive this forward. And uh, thanks to Henriette and our uh, uh, mentors and colleagues who are always taking care of us. And uh, I imagine that together we can make it. So let's wish us all luck. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Roman. You know, we, we take care of the youth because they take care of us <laughs> when we are older. I'm saying that as, a, as, a, as an older person who takes care of my 91-year-old mother, and my children know they are on the line. <laughs> um, we have a bit of time, so is there anyone, before we go into our next uh, um, speaker, um, anyone who wants to make a very short input or a question for one of the speakers, you know, for Vlada or for Lily or for Roman? Oh, we Toko, you've arrived. Um, so um, you can settle down and breathe a little bit. Is there anyone else who wants to make an intervention or have a question? Just switch on your mic, introduce yourself and be brief. Okay, my name is Jose Fisaha, I come from Chad. I would like just to follow up uh, our discussion we had in uh, Malawi during the IGF, Africa IGF. Uh, uh, I would like to know what is the next, I mean, the step of our engagement as a youth. Should we continue to advocate like this or should we advocate to be recognized as a former stakeholder? Because I mean, having young people among uh, governments or private sectors doesn't mean these young people can advocate for our rights. In countries like mine, for instance, where I come from, there is always internet shutdown. Government used to do it. So I don't see that a young person can say to a government, no, don't shut internet because it is a right. We need a formal seat for young people among the global MAC IGF. And Anja is here, so I think you remember about what we have said, and I want you to uh, uh, take this into consideration. And young people present in here in this room, if you do agree with this idea, just give some applause, please. Thanks for, for that question. And, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. So let's continue the discussion. We have a few minutes. Um, next person, just also introduce yourself and be brief. And Anya, maybe you can gather your thoughts and I invite other people who are playing a leadership role in the youth to think of a response to that very important question. Go ahead. 
Um, hello, everyone. Marian Benaisa from Tunisia, um, digital rights activist and a gender based cyber violence researcher. Uh, my question is. Uh, how much are we doing to engage youth? Are we using um, in our project, in our intervention, youth-friendly approaches? Because um, the topics related to um, internet governance and um, online violence, I'm, I'm really glad to see all of these youth gather gathered in this room, but usually they do not really attract many youth. Many of the youth are not, they do not understand what does it mean, they do not understand or know um, how to uh, be or how to take part of this topic, how to intervene, how to participate. So how much are we doing to um, help them be engaged, to understand and uh, to what level are we using youth-friendly approach? Um, uh, Lily, will you respond to that? I just want to add to that, actually. I agree, absolutely. Why are we not talking about TikTok? or Instagram and about the challenges of using platforms that youth are using and the opportunities of influencing those. I, I agree with you. I think we tend to, 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 to try and formalize youth participation, yeah. integrate it into what, you know, the governments, the, the platforms, you know, international civil society organizations are talking about. And there's a whole wealth of governance challenges that are directly related to how youth are using and shaping the internet. Good point. Um, right. I'm going to give the floor now to Lily to respond, and Toko is going to make her intervention after that. Right. I think that is actually spot on, the mention of um, the innovative ways or approaches to engage young people in these conversations. And um, like um, Madam Anre said, the, the issue has been really uh, a matter of the personas and the pathways. We know young people, like Mr. Um, Barak said, are the largest users of the internet, and we've mentioned uh, from examples that there are other platforms which are probably ways that we love to be engaged and how we love to um, also add our input or voices to some of these discussions. Now, it's exciting to note that um, this conversation has pretty much started and has expanded to a large extent. Um, there is a session that's going on today that is going to be talking about youth meta participation, and it's going to be um, the describing how young people can be en um, en engaged in a way that doesn't look like performative representation, just like we are seated and um, like more like we are just being there and there because we want to add to the numbers or sort of tokenism, but in a way that is active so much that we are present and our ideas are being met at a point where our needs are actually um, considered. So like you said, if it is by way of a hackathon or ideathon, that is a way that young people are maybe freely um, able to co um, communicate and so we sh that should be taken up. We've had the issues of hackathons come up and I'm happy to say that this afternoon there's an ideathon and everybody's idea can be pretty much um, infused into what we want to do. The idea thing is at um, 2 5 and what, um, 2 or 5 in this room. What you're looking to do is how do we envision that youth can be engaged in a way that's meaningful to us based on what our, our personas are, the parties to come in, and how we can move our conversation ahead. So that is pretty much the ways that you're looking at beyond just the sitting. Is it a way that we can continue the conversations out of this room? And how can we do that? Is it by programs? Is it by um, boot camps? Is it by everything that we young people love to do? So those are ways that we are looking to engage further. And I think we're on the path to doing that. Um, thanks, Lily. Toko. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tokomia. I'm one of the youth coordinators for the IGF track, and I've been privileged to be part of organizing one of four workshops taking place over the course of the year. And I'm really excited to be here and actually attending the finale at the IGF Youth uh, Summit held here in Addis Ababa. It's an incredible privilege to see a room that's full with uh, young people and old people and to see the kind of um, interest that there is firstly and not firstly not just interest but participation it is wonderful to see young people coming from all around the world and it actually speaks to my first point so I am the founder and CEO of an uh, innovations agency called Startup Toko. And the reason I started this company is because in my home country in South Africa, there is an over 63% unemployment rate. And I think that's what needs to be addressed in the policy concerns that we're going to be uh, talking about. Over the course of the conference, there'll be various experts and high-level panelists speaking about all the wonderful things that are coming with the digital rise and the digital revolution and what this means. I think that it is our onus as young people to take ownership and actually be contributing to the factor that 
we are the innovators, we're the next level, and we have to stand up and speak out. When we enter rooms, it's up to us to actually make those innovation uh, interventions and see where it is that we're able to create the solutions that we require, to create the impact that we want to see amplified and to actually see a rise in young people's um, capabilities, but not only capabilities, young people actually interacting and engaging in the formal economy and the sector and taking charge of not only their own futures, but the future of generations to come, and actually seeing that, you know what, this is definitely something that I would, for myself, want to see as a change in my community, and how can I start by leading the change is firstly by taking that impact myself. So absolutely, the onus is on each and every single one of us to take away from this conference, to bring into this conference, to bring into the summit what it is that we have and our various skills uh, are actually opportunities. Thanks very much, Toko. I think, you know, um, we we have one more speaker there. Um, go ahead. Emmanuel, is that you? And then, and then we'll move on to the next session. I've not forgotten the question that's been asked. We'll come back to it. Emmanuel, over to you. Just introduce yourself, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Henriette. This is Emmanuel from the Togo IGF. So it's to respond to the question of the colleague. He was making a question... Um, uh, right now, regarding the, what can we do? I mean, should we continue making the noise? Or somebody also asked a question to know as youth, should we just continue, I mean, having meetings like this? But one thing from my personal experience is, when we meet in 2016 in Mexico, one of the key points was to engage with the policy makers. I think that was the beginning of the parliamentary track, which today is becoming stronger. So one thing that we can do is to engage with them, those parliamentarians, especially from our various countries, because from the experience in the global south, in countries like the country I'm coming from, I don't think the most of the, how do you call it, policy makers or government, their interest is to vote laws to protect citizens. That's not, uh, that's not the case in most cases. You notice that usually they want to just adapt, you know, the state policy to the global digital situation. Because sometimes, for example, country vote, for example, for data protection laws and things, not because they want to protect the citizens. That's when you look at Africa right now, the number of countries who have voted such laws are many. But how many of them have data protection agencies? So that is clearly showing that we as youth, we have to start engaging, voting good laws. That's very important. He talked about internet shutdown. We do have good laws in some countries, but we don't test them. And as young people, we have to start testing those laws. If you look at the case in Nigeria where uh, the ECOWAS court, for example, condemned the Togolese government, that's a regional court. But if the citizens in Togo didn't take that step or the civil society organization didn't take that step, I don't think today we will have that precedent in the, in the African region where a government has been you know, condemned for shutting down the internet. So we have to test our laws and celebrate our small victory, I mean, victories. Thanks, Emmanuel. And I think you only partially answered that question, but I think you did. I think that, that, that that youth have to participate. They have to participate in policy making, in national level. They have to participate globally. I think the question was a tactical question. Do you form structures as youth in order to participate and in order to be represented consistently, or do you work as individuals or you know, integrate into other advocacy groups? I mean, the answer is probably both, but we'll come back to that. We need to move on. I just want to stress two points that Toko made that I think are very important, and that is that, that if youth are being constrained by poverty, by unemployment, by, by, by social and economic marginalization, political and internet governance empowerment is very hard to achieve. So we, we never really going to have an empowered youth participating in a youth sensitized internet governance if we don't address those underlying social and inequalities. You're never going to have young women participate in internet governance actively if women do not have equal rights. So, so I think that's just important for us to be reminded that, that the struggle has to take place also at that base level of creating more, more, more equal um, and more just societies and economies. 
We're now moving on to our next segment. It was the third question that, that we're addressing. And that's really, I think you've already, I think Torco and Emmanuel have already taken us there, um, towards a better digital future. What do we do now for a better tomorrow? What are the action-oriented insights that youth have gained about ensuring a safer, securer, sustainable digital environment? Uh, particularly through cl collaboration, intergenerational collaboration, and um, collaboration um, with, with leaders and experts. Um, we have with us, I think, is he here online, Tobias Bacherle. He's a member of parliament from Germany. Um, Tobias, are you with us? Yes, yet from Berlin. He's with us online. Um, please go ahead, Tobias. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, all the best from from Berlin. I'm, I'm sadly only joining you uh, tomorrow on site. Um, we can't hear you yet. Can the tech um, team just assist, please? Um, but not starting with two important um, things. So um, online. Um, Tobias can be heard on Zoom. But we cannot hear him in the room. I, um, I, I keep uh, talking, so you might recognize me hearing, um, but uh, I see you nodding. So now we can hear you. Yes, great. Now everyone can hear me once again. Greetings from Berlin. I'm 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 very happy I can join you already online. I will be on site tomorrow. Looking forward to that. But um, now for your for your question, I think it's a very very interesting one. Fostering um, the the possibilities of of digital uh, um, um, of the digital times. Um, and I want to start with one part. I'm a member of the German Parliament for the Greens. So for no surprise, I, I will start with with the the possibilities of green tech. And, and when we talk about green tech and the sustainability uh, possibilities, I do believe there are three things we need to highlight that have, um, as I said, incredible potential. Um, first of all, the possibilities of green tech itself, having um, digital solutions that connect people and therefore, for example, it's a very basic example, you don't have to drive somewhere, you don't have to fly somewhere or whatsoever. But there are so many more possibilities in digital innovation where we can actually become more sustainable in the way we live together. I don't go into details, probably all of you know what I'm talking about. The other point, and this is something that has a huge upcoming right now in Germany, is the question of greener tech. How can we develop technology and digital infrastructure in a way that it's not as harmful for the environment, that, for example, the warmth of server, uh, servers are, is, is better used, for example, for heating in, in buildings nearby. And the third part is um, one where I'm quite ambivalent about, because it's a matter of rebound effects. Thinking rebound effects uh, with you, if you have green tech, if you have a digital solution, it's often the case that it actually saves energy, saves uh, resources, but then people start to use it even more, which is a great thing, but I think sometimes it needs to be discussed where the limits to digital um, um, tech actually is and where do we have a certain rebound effect where we have a great innovation, but in the end have it used that much that it's actually way more harmful. And in that case, all of those, I believe, Yauf can be a driving force or must be a driving force. I'm saying this as a young member of parliament from the Green Party, being well aware that young people are voting for my party, but they're not voting exactly for my party. I would rather say most of them are in Germany voting for our main cause, the question of climate protection. And on the other hand, young people often are digital natives. I will do one quick shift into that because when I say often, I do believe this shows how important global connectivity actually is because when we talk about a young generation that is 
digital natives that understands the impact of digital tech further and deeper because it has been um, raised up with it. It also, I think, shows the necessity to give access to digital um, connectivity to basically everyone because otherwise the gap between those who have access and those who have not access would, would only keep up spreading and widening. Because when we think about those people who started to work on who basically got connected in an old age, they are rather starting on, on an even playing field. But if we have one part of the world or some people having great connectivity, living up with digital uh, connectivity and others don't have that, that's the thing that um, people have to catch up on later, which I believe is an inequality we need to tackle. But coming back to the digital natives, I do believe they understand the impact of digital tech way more enhanced, way more deeper. They are a driving force behind it, but they are also can be like the warning signs for things if things go wrong, not only when it comes to rebound effects, to green tech, but also when it comes to the matter of privacy and having digital tech um, actually enabling human rights, enabling free speech, enabling privacy, and not having the opposite happen. Thank you very much for, for uh, listening to, to some of my thoughts, why, why we, uh, how we can pursue um, digital, uh, yeah, free new tech. Thanks very much, um, Tobias, and for reminding us that a, that a better digital future is meaningless if we don't have a sustainable planet and, and a sustainable environment. Um, next, we have um, Jenna Fung, who is the regional coordinator, youth regional coordinator from the Asia-Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum. Jenna is with us online as well. Jenna, please go ahead. Let's hear from you. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? We can, we can hear you. Great. Thank you very much for giving me the time and having me on this panel, joining Tokyo's on this um, topic of making our uh, digital better and internet better. Um, I, I would like Tobias cover quite a lot of area about how we can make our internet more like safer and uh, more secure and sustainable. So I was actually would like to raise two points that um, we have got from the youth in Asia Pacific two months ago in Singapore when we have the youth IGF there. Um, I think there's two points that youth would like to bring um, and contribute to the process of making our internet better and our digital better by um, uh, closing the gaps in knowledge and mutual understanding between generations in the internet governance policy making community as well as developing a decentralized supporting models for meaningful meaningful participation because IGF itself it's a complex ecosystem without participation from all stakeholders it, it won't thrive as how it's supposed to be and as a youth individuals in leadership who works closely with newcomer in this ecosystem I could reassure you that empowering our next generation is the key to sustain the multi-stakeholder model for our policy making discussion. So for the so first, first one, just to just clarify a little bit, I, be, I, I believe there are things we should do to close the gap in knowledge, not only um, in youth, um, in terms of the, their experience and knowledge and internet governance related issues and topic. Uh, but, uh, but also, also we, should we should work on closing mutual, mutual understanding, understanding between, between generations, generations in our, our community. community. You've at Crossroad as, as the opener of the theme of Asia-Pacific Asia Asia YIGF give a context of transisting state of youth is in and, and how it influenced discussion on sustainability and inclusion for youth engagement. For many years, we have been focusing on closing knowledge gaps and empowering the youth with capacity to catch up with discussion from the majority. Undeniably, that's important, that's important for newcomers. For newcomers. However, However, often our community, community neglect, neglect the fact that mutual that understanding among other stakeholders, stakeholders as well as members of different, different generations in the community is also, is also one, one of the of major the factors, factors for sustainability and inclusion of meaningful participation, participation that, may that may eventually, eventually contribute, contribute to a, a more, more sustainable, sustainable digital future. future. While mostly, mostly focused on, on um, 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 on empowering, on empowering our, youth, our youth, I think, I think we have we done have lots of great work, work in different regions already. already. And then, and then I, I, believe I believe most of you managed, managed to meet so many, so many other, other youth coordinators, coordinators and, and 
in, in the room this year. And I, I would like to say a big thanks to everyone who has been contributing to the process of um, making this youth glo global youth summit happen. Because this year, many of the coordinators sit together with the U UN ICF Secretariat to make this um, event happen in an inclusive and open way. I, and I really appreciate it. From the Asia Pacific perspective, for more people to engage in global IGF or some other internet governance event in order to join the policymaking process. And from a lesson that we got from Asia Pacific this year, we realized that decentralized funding and supporting model may be the future of meaningful participation of the youth. Because taking examples of the Asia Pacific, um, we managed to get some private sectors or organizations to support the individuals from the local community to join our regional meetings. And I believe that's very important because that's how the youth can get into a bigger stage to meet other people in order to make change. Three years back, we joined um, our, my first Global Youth Summit in Berlin for IGF 2019. And that's one of the inspiration on how I think as a youth coordinator for Asia Pacific YGF, um, I should take in stock of those models because the coordinators of that year's Global Youth Summit and all the organizers was trying so hard to get so many different private sectors in helping youth to get engaged and stay engaged. And so perhaps I think it's time for us to think on and working harder on how we ensure, ensure the, continuation the continuation and consistency, consistency of, of youth, youth engagement, engagement and make, and make our, our work, work better, better and great, and great together. together. Thank you so, Thank you much. so much. Thank you very much, Jenna, um, for that input. And I think we've now, we've heard about having impact. I think Emmanuel talked about impact at national level. I think Tobias demonstrated impact at national level. He's a young parliamentarian in the German um, Parliament. And Jenna is talking about regional, that you can have impact in regional. So this global process is extremely important, but we cannot put all our eggs in the basket of the global IGF. And um, for youth to have influence and impact, they need to work and organize and participate nationally and regionally as well. Um, to, to, to open us with some comments and questions for, for Tobias and Jenna, I want to invite um, um, Fio from, from Myanmar, who is the Myanmar Youth IGF coordinator. I met her this morning, so I know she's here. I'm not sure. There she is. Please, Fio, please take the floor. Hello. 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 Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Fio from Myanmar, and I'm a you IGF coordinator of Myanmar UIGF. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing very insightful knowledge and uh, insightful uh, input uh, from the speaker. And I would like to uh, um, um, continue uh, uh, discuss about the uh, sustainability and the safer internet, and also about the uh, secure internet as well. Uh, I think it is important that Jenna mentioned that uh, you are playing a big role in the community for in, in order to sustain our community as well. Uh, I also think like uh, it is important that multi-stakeholder approach is playing the key role to shape the policies and to develop the policy as well. But one thing is that um, oh, um, Although young people are playing a key role, I think um, they are still lacking the specific support for uh, involve, uh, getting involved in the policy development process. Uh, yes, uh, that's, um, I can, we can see that uh, there are many, uh, uh, you are having uh, opportunities and uh, on the other hand, the challenges are belonging with us as well. So I'd like to mention that uh, it is the uh, uh, questioning the rules of the young people specific 
involvement in the policy making and uh, in the discussion of the digital uh, policy development as well. In addition to that, I think uh, young people are still needing the strong support from the community and uh, uh, for, for our sustainable involvement uh, in this community. Whatever we are, uh, whatever we are doing, and whatever we are, we are uh, being here. For example, like, um, for the young people from the underprivileged uh, uh, community, let's say from the underdeveloping country, it is impossible to attend the conference like this one because it's very costly for them as well. So I think uh, they are sustainable. Uh, informants are depending on the financial uh, sustainability. So I would like to mention that uh, the uh, UNI uh, sustainability are also uh, depending on the financial sustainability as well. So why I mention about the UNI are playing an important role is that they are the um, uh, main player. Uh, who are having to engage with their local community as well as their regional community as well. So, uh, in terms of uh, uh, improving the internet developments and uh, in improving our knowledge on the safer and secure internet, um, I think the young people, the, the UNIs, are, are, are should get much support from the different community. Of course, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, training uh, events like this one. So finally, uh, I, I would like to uh, um, I would like to uh, question to all of the young people here. It says, have you already think about how to protect ourselves? Uh, why surfing the internet and why uh, surfing the safer and secure internet? Have you already talked about how to how we can protect ourselves, and have you already uh, have you been talk uh, think about how we can advocate and educate the end use, uh, people uh, from uh, young people uh, how to protect themselves online? Because we can see th that many end users are the are not came from the uh, technical background. So I think that we also needing the educating program. Uh, for the digital safety and security, that kinds of the education programs are also needed for them, especially uh, to those end users who are using the internet. On the other hand, I think uh, the basic knowledge about the uh, about the application, um, as Mr. Barrett uh, mentioned, like uh, we have to maintain uh, when we are developing one thing, we have to maintain. May, uh, we have to think about how to maintain that one. On the, uh, the, the another possibility is that we can think about how we can uh, share the knowledge about using that application to the uh, customer or the end user as well. Yeah, this this is my point. Th of thank you, Phil. Thank Thanks very much for that. We have um, uh, Tobias, um, Jenna. Do you want to respond to Phil's question? You have one minute each. Um, digital um, literacy, literacy is key, is key. Um, um, and, and when you go, when you go talking about digital, digital literacy in schools, schools I, think I think that's also that's key, but you have yeah, always, always one problem, problem. The, teachers the teachers often are, are, are all there, there out of university. university. First of all, you need to get the teachers back on track. They have to be educated and not front when it comes to disinformation on digital literacy and so on and safety in the internet and everything. Um, but they need to be educated, not fearful of the internet. That's very important. And I'm not saying that's always working out. But you also need other institutions working on that. Um, for example, we have the Young um, Content uh, Network of the Public Broadcast in Germany. It's called Funk. They have, have a um, educational purpose as well. And they're also doing a lot of things on safety in the internet, um, how to be safe in the internet. So those, are, I think, are, are two very important things. Um, and besides that, of course, address it publicly as often you can. And of course, every security breach uh, that needs an update or where uh, you need to update your passwords and so on, address it publicly, try to reach as many people as possible. Thanks, Tobias. Jenna, do you want to add something quickly?
literacy program or education process compulsory at school, like in the public education system. And then I think Toby has mentioned about the barriers or challenges behind it. So was, I personally am a person that um, strongly advocate for collaborations between stakeholders. So maybe one of the ways to have our youth educate our youth, that may be one of the way we can do it. Because I think some of the speaker mentioned, most of the youth are actually digital natives. And then some of the youth are actually getting old and then they, they may have the experience to educate. Um, educate our next generation, which is like younger, because I think some of the people in Asia Pacific mentioned to me two years ago, we should start this digital liter literacy uh, education when they're young, like when when they're in primary school, not not when they're in university. So start early, probably. I, I, I'm confident that we may have the capacity to do this kind of education at a certain level. That's what I want to add. Thank you. Apologies for that echo. Thanks very much, Jenna and Tobias. We, we need to move on. We're coming to the end of our session. I just want to say, in response to Fio's question, here at the IGF, in the IGF village, you will find a booth uh, called the Digital Security Hub or something like that. And what you'll find there is actually people that will help you with digital security, but also with green tech and sustainable use of sustainable energy and renewable energy with, with hosting and with technology. So anybody who wants to learn more about sustainable technology and also about digital security, there are people in the IJF village who can help you. Um, thanks very much, everyone. We're coming to the end. Um, next, I want to invite um, to, to the floor She's with us online, Ms. Hilary Bakri, um, from the Office of the United Nations Youth Envoy. Hilary, are you able to join us and take the floor? Hello, can you hear me fine? Yes. yes. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. Good morning, morning from New York, everyone. My name is Hilary. I am joining on behalf of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Ms. Jaya Mawikramanayake, who unfortunately is not able to join us today. Uh, firstly, before I start, please allow me to thank UN DESA and the IGF Secretariat, as well as the host country for having us and for the Secretariat's commitment to highlighting youth as a critical aspect of this year's forum. So allow me to start my remarks by reminding all of us that we are living in unprecedented times and to also re-highlight some of the points that our youth speakers have raised, uh, that our world today has not only the most educated and the most connected generation of young people that the world has ever seen, but also a generation who are living in a time of triple planetary crisis, pandemic, and also the threat of a global economic crisis. I want to highlight this because as we just heard from all the three different dialogues in this um, idea of youth summit, we could instantly see that despite all these um, um, uh, challenges, young people, those who are present here uh, with you in the room, uh, online, as well as many others out there, are resilient, hopeful, and also resourceful. Um, as also highlighted in the early discussion, uh, digital transformation comes with a lot of exciting opportunities. Um, uh, just a few months ago at the Transforming Education Summit in New York, uh, young activists and teachers highlighted that it is indeed possible to achieve the highest aspiration for education uh, and lifelong learning if we ensure our digital transformations leaves no one behind. Last week at COP27, uh, young people called for democratization of technology transfer and accessibility that can, that can positively help us accelerate the just and green transition that our world desperately, desperately needs. I believe Tobias earlier also highlighted this on the point of green technology and how young people have called for it. Um, a lot of these exciting opportunities can be achieved, obviously, if we ensure young people are included as equal partners. I think that's the key word. Um, uh, to not only just be engaged as uh, participant, but also as equal partners, because young people are the ones that can help shape the course of these opportunities for the better, and they are capable of leading not just as partners, but also as experts, and I'm sure you could agree to this after hearing all of the young people that have shared their intervention here today in the, in the forum, both online and offline. Uh, even here, as I said, in the Internet Governance Forum, and uh, I think many of my fellow speakers highlighted earlier, young people did not wait and sit still, but uh, they also advocated themselves to be included in this table and many other tables and also mobilized to ensure young people's participation in this forum is institutionalized. Um, 
However, I think it is also important for all of us to acknowledge that technology is not neutral and the internet being the lifeline of our digital transformation also increasingly face challenges that put a lot of young people as a user at risk. Um, earlier last year, our office uh, launched the Global Report on Protection of Young People in Civic Space, where the report highlighted that 78% of the youth respondents um, actually reported that they have experienced some sort of digital, digital threats. Uh, moreover, for young women and girls, this digital risk, as we know, are constantly increasing. In a recent survey, um, uh, I believe launched by Plan International, from 14,000 of young women and girls, 58% of them shared that they have experienced online harassment. Um, online civic spaces have also continuously faced challenges, as many of the young speakers have also, and also the other speakers have highlighted earlier, with internet shutdowns continuing to exist, increasing, and having preventing young people from exercising their rights. Uh, and further excluding young people from civic and political participation. Now, please really allow me to emphasize that to ignore the number of digital online threats and also to ignore the structural barriers that take place against the most vulnerable is to also turn your back on the world's largest generation of digital natives. We really need commitment and investment, um, as many of the speakers have highlighted earlier, directed to meaningful youth engagement to achieve this. Uh, we need a digital future that is not only inclusive, but also safe, um, trustworthy, and also reliable, that can, uh, an internet that can serve as the foundation of our lifeline for our digital transformation. And the only way to ensure this is by having human rights at the center of our global internet governance, and also inclusivity at the heart of our efforts to address this, uh, the digital divide that still exists. Uh, at the UN, when the UN Secretary General presented his uh, proposal for our common agenda, um, Human rights is undoubtedly the foundational pillar. Uh, so according to the Secretary General's call for the Internet Governance Forum to continue to be agile and supporting effective governance of the digital commons, it is really my sincere hope and our office's hope that the insights, the recommendations, and the calls for collaboration that young people just shared uh, in our dialogue today can be taken forward to partnership at both local and global level beyond this forum. Uh, particularly also the recommendation that young people have called, um, as I, I believe have, uh, have been highlighted by Lily, Theo, and many other of the speakers earlier, and having a stronger educational resources, uh, digital literacy for young people, um, including having capacity building on online protection, digital safety, and how to uphold human rights online, as well as the points I believe highlighted by the previous speaker, uh, speaker Jenna, on addressing barriers for young people to contribute to policy process uh, and leveraging on multi-stakeholder partnership to support youth participation across different forums and processes. Uh, therefore, I really like to urge everyone, the young people here um, and everywhere, the policymakers, industry and international leaders, to also see the Art a Common Agenda recommendation um, introduced in the United Nations earlier. Uh, this year, in particular, the Global Digital Compact recommendation as an opportunity to collaborate together in shaping an open, free and secure digital future uh, for all of us uh, through a multi-stakeholder approach. I believe some of our speakers also highlighted this and I will share the information through the Zoom link uh, just shortly after this. Our office, the Office of Secretary General's Envoy, and we really, really look forward to continue our support of this recommendation to collaboration with the Office of the Tech Envoy and also all the partners that are already engaged here, but also those who are just started to joining. Uh, to ensure that young people as right holders can be included in shaping the process so we can achieve a digital transformation that could benefit all youth in all of their diversity. I thank you once again for having us and congratulations uh, once again for a very, very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much, Hilary, and thank you for emphasizing the importance of the centrality of human rights and of inclusivity and for reminding us about the opportunity presented by the Global Digital Compact. It's a process which is open, it's, it's online. Youth can submit input into the development of that document, which will then be discussed by UN member states in 2024 at the Summit of the Future. And that's an opportunity for you to actually draft input as a collective, but also as individuals about how you feel um, our global digital future, what principles it should be based on. 
Um, Lily has an announcement about what you can do if you want to continue this discussion online, and then we'll bring our session to a close. Right. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation and the input. So we want to have this moved on, and a way to do that is to continue the conversation and to essentially have our recommendations come to the forefront of discussions. So we are going to have some links shared via the mailing list um, that is the IGF Youth, where you, you find a link for participation in the various groups that exist and how you can participate um, beyond this meeting. And for people who are on site, there's another one for people here in Addis Ababa, and there'll be some sessions you'll be invited to and meetings that um, you'll be invited to to just continue the conversation and pretty much to have the discussion move forward. So look out for those two. If you have any um, questions afterwards, you're not able to find the link, be, be sure to find me and ask for that. Thank you. Thanks, Lily. And if you are not yet uh, on the mailing list of IG IGF Youth, what do you do if you want to join that mailing list? Absolutely. So um, on the IGF website, there is the opportunity to, for you to find the mailing list. Um, the link, there's a link for you to just hit subscribe to, and Anya and her team will be able to have you up there in a day or two. Right. And I'm on that list, so I can tell those that are not young, they let us older people on that list as well, because you know, empowering the youth is an intergenerational. We have the minister with us, which is fantastic. Um, while Lily is giving up her seat, uh, I'm very honored to invite to give us some closing um, remarks. Um, the State Minister from the Ministry of Innovation and Technology, this is the ministry that is our host, that has been working really hard to prepare. And we've been on a panel before, so I'm very happy to have you here. Um, Ms. Huria Ali Mahdi. Um, she will give us some closing remarks, um, and I am very happy that you came in time. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, all users, beautiful users. How are you? We are happy to host you. We are very glad. I hope you will have a very enjoyable and successful time. So we are very happy to have you here in Ethiopia. We hope that you will get a lot of relevant benefits from this forum as a use. You know, you guys are the power for the world. So let me start my closing speech. First, I would like to start by thanking all of you for participating in this historical event. So the speakers for their excellent thoughts, provoking talks, the moderators for organizing and maintaining the agenda using timely, reasonably I would like also to thank all participants. Your inputs to the workshop contribute immensely to the success of this panel. The IGF 2022 you Track aims at creating a set of activities to connect youth from around the world among themselves and also create opportunities for them to network with senior stakeholders experts, internet governance. I can say the IGF 2022 Youth Summit is a success and congratulations to all of you. I don't want to, <clears throat> to repeat summaries from this session's chairperson. Instead, let me try to share with you my personal takeaway from this Youth Summit. The digital transformation was among the topics of interest to youth. The capacity of development activities tackle specific issues nested under this bright team. Users are the power of today and the hope for the future. The youth agenda in the digital transformation programs is not for the sake of the youth purse. In fact, users benefit from digital transformation. However, including the concern of the youth in digital transformation, agenda will help countries to realize immense powers and ideas which directly contribute to the, to the development of the country. 
if we don't if we don't include the youth agenda in the digital transformation it's not only the contribution of the youth that we lose it's the future of the country that we compromised the domains of education economy and peace can be advanced by going digital however to create a real impact there is a need to have holistic approach providing infrastructure is a necessary condition but not a sufficient one to gain the benefit skills right content and above all affordable access is necessary the digital transformation provides a real opportunity for social prosperity if all the components of the digital transformation are present namely affordable infrastructure relevant digital content and the right skills online harms and cyber attacks can also be the cause for not properly using available infrastructures such attacks can hamper the use of digital systems and cause further harm by inhibiting equal access and equal opportunity stakeholders should consider those factors to create an internet to benefit all ladies and gentlemen the youth submit is very useful and should continue i hope everybody agrees with me please show me your agreements by appeals So I am very happy to announce that the youth summit will continue and to be held in Japan next year in 2023. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Minister Mahdi. I know how busy you are, so it means a lot to, to have you here. So everyone on this, we, we bring the session to a close. I think um, Minister Mahdi reminded us that we'll meet again next year, but I think the discussion demonstrated that there's much to be done in between. It needs to be done at different levels, nationally, regionally, globally, issue-based, um, but we also need to consider how we organize. So it's not just about participating, it's also about institutionalizing, as Barack said, but I'm using that in a positive way, creating structures that provide continuity for youth participation at different levels. So I want to apologize to the non-English speakers. I know it was difficult to follow. Unfortunately, there's no interpretation, um, particularly the Benin Hub has been trying to listen and follow. Um, also, a special welcome to the Bangladesh Hub. I'm sorry we couldn't take your question. Um, and to everyone who worked to organize this session. She sits over there, Anya, you know how, how vital she is to this process, but she's not alone. So please give a big applause to, to Anya and to all the IGF youth coordinators who are here and who are virtual. Thank you very much. The session is now closed. Can I just suggest one thing? Um, now that we have some time for lunch and we'll probably be walking that way, could I suggest to take a photo at the official booth, uh, booth screen so we make it a, a little bit more official than the one that we made when we entered? Yes.